This is the introduction to Renegade by Cordell Scotton by Isaac Asimov. Notable Robots by Isaac Asimov. My robot stories and novels seem to have become classics in their own right, and with the advent of the Robot City series of novels, to have become the wider literary universe of other writers as well. Under those circumstances, it might be useful to go over my robot stories and describe some of those which I think are particularly significant, and to explain why I think they are. 1. Robbie This is the first robot story I wrote. I turned it out between May 10th and May 22nd of 1939, when I was 19 years old and was just about to graduate college. I had a little trouble placing it, for... John Campbell rejected it, and so did Amazing Stories. However, Fred Powell accepted it on March 25, 1940, and it appeared in the September 1940 issue of Super Science Stories, which he edited. Fred Powell, being Fred Powell, changed the title to Strange Playfellow, but I changed it back when I included it in my book, I, Robot, and it is repeated as Robbie in every subsequent incarnation. Aside from being my first robot story, Robbie is significant because in it, George Weston says to his wife in defense of a robot that is fulfilling the role of a nursemaid. He just can't help being the f being faithful and loving and kind. He's a machine, made so. This is the first indication, in my first story, of what eventually became the first law of robotics, and of the basic fact that robots were built... With, were made with inbuilt safety rules. Number two, reason. Robbie would have met, meant nothing in itself if I had written no more robot stories, particularly since it appeared in one of the minor magazines. However, I wrote a second robot story, Reason, and that one John Campbell liked. After a bit of revision, it appeared in the April 1941 issue of Astounding Science Fiction and there it attracted notice. Readers became aware that there was such a thing as the posteronic robots, and so did Campbell. That made everything afterward possible. 3. Liar In the very next issue of Astounding, that of May 1941, my third robot story, Liar, appeared. The importance of the story was that it introduced Susan Calvin, who became a central character in my early robot stories. This story was originally rather clumsily done, largely because it dealt with the relationship between the sexes at a time when I had not yet had my first date with a young lady. Fortunately, I am a quick learner, and it is one story in which I made significant changes before allowing it to appear in iRobot. 4. Runaround the next important robot story appeared in the March 1942 issue of Astounding. It was the first story in which I listed the three laws of robotics explicitly, instead of making them implicit. In it, I have one character, Gregory Powell, say to another, Michael Donovan, Now look, let's start with the three fundamental rules of robotics, the three rules that are built most deeply into a robot's postronic brain. He then recites them. Later on, I called them the Laws of Robotics, and their importance to me is threefold. A. They guided me in forming my plots and made it possible to write many short stories and several novels in addition, based on robots. In these, I constantly studied the consequences of the three laws. B. It was by all odds my most famous literary invention, quoted in season and out by others. If all I have written is some day to be forgotten, the three laws of robotics will surely be the last to go. C. The passage in Runaround, quoted above, happens to be the very first time the words robotics was used in print in the English language. I am therefore credited with the d invention of the word, and also robotic, posteronic, and psychol history by the Oxford English Dictionary, which takes the trouble and the space to quote the three laws. All these were created by my twenty-second birthday, and I seem to have created nothing since, which gives rise to grievous thoughts within me. 
five evidence this was the one and only story i wrote while i spent eight months and twenty-six days in the army at one point i persuaded a kindly librarian to let me remain in the locked library over lunch so that i could work on the story it is the first story in which i make use of a humanoid robot Stephen Brierly, the humanoid robot in question, though in the story I don't make it absolutely clear whether he's a robot or not, represents my first approach toward R. Danielle Oliva, the human form robot who appears in a number of my novels. novels. Evidence appeared in the September 1946 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. 6. Little Lost Robot my robots tend to be benign entities. In fact, as the stories progressed and they gradually gained in moral and ethical qualities until they far surpassed human beings, and in the case of Daniel, approached the godlike. Nevertheless, I had no intention of limiting myself to robots as saviors. I followed wherever the wild winds of my imagination led me, and I was quite capable of seeing the uncomfortable sides of robot phenomena. It was only a few weeks ago, as I write this, that I received a letter from a reader that scolded me because in a robot story of mine that had just been published, I showed the dangerous side of robots. He accused me of a failure of nerve. That he was wrong is shown by Little Lost Robot, in which a robot is the villain, even though it appeared nearly half a century ago. The seamy side of robots is not the result of a failure in nerve that comes of my advancing age and decrepitude. It has been a constant concern of mine all through my career. <laughs> 7. The Inevitable Conflict This was an, a sequel to Evidence and appeared in the June 1950 issue of Astounding. It was the first story I wrote that dealt primarily with computers, I called them machines in the story, rather than with robots, per se. The difference is not a great one. You might define a robot as a computerized machine, or as a mobile computer. In any case, I clearly did not distinguish between the two, and although the machines, which don't make an actual physical appearance in the story, are clearly computers, I included the story, without hesitation, in my robot collection, I, Robot, and neither the publisher nor the readers objected. To be sure, Stephen Brierly is in the story, but the question of his roboticity plays no role. 8. Franchise This was the first story in which I dealt with computers as computers, and had no thought in mind of their being robots. It appeared in the August 1955 issue of If Worlds of Science Fiction, and by that time I had grown familiar with the existence of computers. My computer is Multivac, designed as an obviously larger and more complex version of the actually existing Univac. In this story, and in some of the others of the period that dealt with Multivac, I described it as an enormously large machine missing the chance of predicting the miniaturization and etherealization of computers. 9. The Last Question My imagination didn't betray me for long, however. In The Last Question, which appeared first in the November 1956 issue of Science Fiction Quarterly, I discussed the miniaturization and etherealization of computers, and followed it through a trillion years of evolution, of both computer and man, to find a logical conclusion that you will have to read the story to find. It is, beyond question, my favorite among all the stories I have written in my career. 10. The Feeling of Power The miniaturization of computers played a small role as a side issue in this story. It appeared in the February 1958 issue of If, and is also one of my favorites. In this story, I deal with pocket computers, which were not to make their appearance in the marketplace until 10 to 15 years after the story appeared. Moreover, it was one of the stories in which I actually foresaw accurately a social implication of technological advance, rather than the technological advance itself. The story deals with the potential loss of ability to do simple arithmetic through the perpetual use of computers. 
I wrote it as satire that combined with, com with humor, with passages of bitter irony, but I wrote more truly than I knew. These days I have a pocket computer, and I begrudge the time and effort it would take me to subtract a 182 from 854. I use the darned computer. The feeling of power is one of the most frequently anthologized of my stories. In a way, this story shows the negative side of computers, and in this period I also write stories that show the potential vengeful reactions of computers or robots that are mistreated. For computers, there is Someday, which appears in the August 1956 issue of Infinity Science Fiction, and for robots, in automobile form, see Sally, which appeared in the May-June 1953 issue of Fantastic. 11. Female Intuition My robots are almost always masculine, though not necessarily in an actual sense of gender. After all, I give them masculine names and refer to them as he. At the suggestion of a female editor, Judy Lynn Del Rey, I wrote Female Intuition, which appeared in the October 1969 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. It showed, for one thing, that I could do a feminine robot, too. She was still metal, but she had a narrower waistline than my usual robots, and had a feminine voice, too. Later on, in my book Robots and Empire, there was a chapter in which a humanoid female robot made her appearance. She played a villainous role, which might surprise those who know of my frequently displayed admiration of the female half of humanity. 12. The Bicentennial Man This story, which first appeared in 1976 in a paperback anthology of original science fiction, Stellar No. 2, edited by Judy Lynn Del Rey, was my most thoughtful exposition of the development of robots. It followed them in an entirely different direction from that in the last question. What it dealt with was the desire of a robot to become a man, and the way in which he carried out the desire, step by step. Again, I carried the plot all the way to its logical conclusion. I had no intention of writing this story when I started it. It wrote itself, and it turned and twisted in the typewriter. It ended as the third favorite of mine among all my stories. Ahead of it come only the last question, mentioned above, and The Ugly Little Boy, which is not a robot story. 13. The Caves of Steel Meanwhile, at the suggestion of Horace L. Gold, editor of Galaxy, I had written a robot novel. I had resisted doing so at first, for I felt that my robot ideas only fit for the short story length. Gold, however, suggested that I write a murder mystery dealing with a robot detective. I followed it part way. My detective was a thoroughly human Elijah Bailey, perhaps the most attractive character I ever invented in my opinion. But he had a robot sidekick, R. Daniel Oliva. The book, I felt, was the perfect fusion of mystery and science fiction. It appeared as a three-part serial in the October, November, and December 1953 issues of Galaxy, and Doubleday published it as a novel in 1954. What surprised me about the book was the reaction of the readers. While they approved of Lige Bailey, their obvious interest was entirely with Daniel, who I had viewed as a mere subsidiary character. The approval was particularly intense in the case of the woman who wrote to me. Thirteen years after I had invented Daniel, the television series Star Trek came out, with Mr. Spock resembling Daniel quite closely in character, something which did not bother me, and I noticed that women viewers were particularly interested in him, too. I won't pretend to analyze this. 14. The Naked Sun the popularity of Lige and Daniel led me to write a sequel, The Naked Sun, which appeared as a three-part serial in the October, November, and December 1956 issues of Astounding, and was published as a novel by Doubleday in 1957. Naturally, the repetition of the success made a third novel seem the logical thing to do. 
I even started writing it in 1958, but things got in the way, and what with one thing and another, it didn't get written until 1983. 15. The Robots of Dawn This, the third novel of the Lige Bailey slash R. Daniel series, was published by Doubleday in 1983. In it, I introduced a second robot, R. Giscard Reventlov, and this time I was not surprised when he turned out to be as popular as Daniel. 16. Robots in Empire when it was necessary to allow Lige Bailey to die, of old age, I felt it would have no problem in doing a fourth book in the series, provided I allowed Daniel to live. The fourth book, Robots and Empire, was published by Doubleday in 1985. Lige's death brought some reaction, but nothing at all compared to the storm of regretful letters I received when the existencies of the plot made it necessary for Argus Card to die. So it turns out that my robot stories have been almost as successful as my foundation books. And if you want to know the truth, in a whisper of course, and please keep this confidential, I like my robot stories better. Here in Renegade, Cordell Scotton has written an excellent example of why I like the robot stories. A simple question arising from the laws, what is good for humans? is developed into a complex and intriguing story. And that is all I'm going to do for today. It'll be put down as introduction. And part one will come out on Tuesday. I hope you've all enjoyed and have a good day. Bye!